Thanks for attending a session of a little people. Um, I think we're running a bit behind. It's sort of ingrained in all of us to take tea. So just uh, a, one or two little changes is that due to flight arrangement, um, Stuart Expects will be uh, speaking next, so it will just be a slight shuffle in the, in the program. Um, we'll, we'll start with my talk, thanks. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, so um, as you can see, we've got a nice and short and sweet um, talk today, or session today. The reason for that is we decided to go for a few issues with regards to elbow fractures in children, which um, is, comes to all of us, but the implications of the wrong treatment can have long-term effects. Um, but the other reason is, I don't know if you've uh, noticed, but uh, the chance of citing a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in this last few days is much less than citing a leopard. So um, we've got just a few lectures. As you all know, most of us orthopedic surgeons don't really use anything but uh, K-wires. So I, I thought I'd better make a declaration this time. We only use KYs for the elbow fractures, and uh, Cypos needs money, so we came up with an excellent idea to, to um, make some money. The, the pediatric orthopedic surgeons is well known for their prowess, prowess in economics. So please, uh, we've devised this very funky looking uh, glow-in-the-dark K wires and uh, we're expecting huge royalties, so, so please uh, start using them. Uh, and if other organizations got any problems with uh, finances, just come and see us. We, we'll, we'll be able to help you. <coughs> so I don't know if you know the book by Mercer Rang, but it's really a fantastic book. And he starts his chapter on the elbows with this. And, it, and it's so true, and, and it's true because we literally can't see what we're doing, and you, and you have to use a bit of faith and a bit of inferences to understand what's going on with uh, these very young kids' uh, elbows. And we all know why, we all know the very nice nomic uh, Criteau, but the fact of the matter about this uh, is that it's incredibly variable. It's even variable between the both sides. And under the age of three and definitely under the age of two, there's actually just nothing to see, so you can't really use this to decide what is going on with regards to that fracture. And that's why I, I just wanted to spend some time for this whole session on developmental anatomy of a distal humerus and how that can really help you to predict all these little fracture type patterns, transphysial types of lateral condyles, supracondylar in the very young child. <clears throat> so I think the first fact is to know that the joint capsules and the ligaments are just so much stronger than the physis and the osseous column in a young child. So for all practical reasons, you won't see a dislocation in a child under three years and very seldom under the age of 10 years. If you do see it and you think it's that, go and look very closely and you'll probably see a fracture or a fracture pattern. So what happens in the neonate? The neonate gets born, everything is basically cartilaginous and that gives a very elastic, bouncy strength to this area. You've got a very immature area here uh, in the columns, but what is very interesting, the so-called supracondylar fossa is actually situated within the metaphysis, through the physis and in the epiphysis, making this a very weak area combined to a sort of transverse um, growth plate with no undulations. And that's why when a newborn gets pulled on his or her arm, the place where it's going to break is the transphysial uh, separation. The next six months, nothing really changes. We've got our um, columns starting to form. This fossa is still within the uh, area uh, where, uh, of the physis, and you've got no changes on your growth plate. It's still smooth, and everything basically happens through the physis in that age group. As you start getting older, you develop your ossification centers. As I said, it's very variable. Um, you're starting to get some maturation of your columns and your supracondylar fossa starting to form and mature. But you've still got a smooth and uh, transverse growth plate. And again, in this age group, it's most probably going to be a physial fracture rather than, or physial separation rather than a fracture. Going on to the interest, so, interest sort of uh, area of two to three years, You've now got your medial epicondyle that's starting to mature and starting to become an area at risk due to its configuration. You've now got a curved um, physis, which gives some strength. 
So that's why in the age of two to three, you've got a sort of an overhang between either fissural separations or supracondylar fractures. Five to six years, we've got a matured physis. It's um, uh, contoured, it's undulated, so it's in effect becoming stronger and more resistant to our now matured supracondylar fossa, and that's why in this age group you've got a lot of uh, um, supracondylar fractures rather than se physical separations. And then at seven to ten years, um, same thing, this is now definitely an area of risk, but your epicondyles, uh, due to a certain stage of development, is now also at risk, uh, especially your medial epicondyle. And then, for all practical reasons, except the weaker capitalum that's proven in adolescence, you get your adult fracture patterns in the adolescence groups. So what happens, we start with a weak physis, strong soft tissues, and we slowly progress down to a weak supracondylar fo fossa and weaker soft tissues. And that's where you get these age ranges of a transfusial fracture of age 0 to 3, um, supracondylar fractures and lateral condyle fractures in this age group, and they can both transgress into the transfusial group, but uh, very unlikely. So how do you approach this um, injury in elbows in, in, in children? Um, and the treatment's quite easy. It's all about the diagnosis. So we just saw you can use age ranges to get an idea of what fracture probably occurred. Mechanism injury is mostly a hyperextension injury, so uh, there's some help with some of these cases. Um, and then x-rays is a bit of a conundrum, but you can, if it's there, use your ossification centers. And I think much more important is your skeletal relationships when looking at the x-rays of these children. And then there's one or two quite important um, auxiliary diagnostic tools which you can use that really helps you in the treatment of these kids. So I'll be using the transphysial fracture as a sort of example how we approach it through, through that diagram. It's scarce, but I've got no doubt that it's much, I've just audited uh, and looked at our, our stats, much more common in a South African setting, and I think it's due to the higher incidence of non-accidental injury than these areas where these reviews were done. So how do you get a transphysial fracture? Well, the, the literature very nicely describes or eloquently says forces of labor. I don't know what it means by that. It probably just means it's a, a guy named that's struggling. He's just cut the ureta and now he's pulling on the arm. So um, that's probably what happens there. And it happens in cesarean sections as well as normal childbirth. Um, but I think what's extremely important is to realize that non-accidental injury is a uh, etiology of this uh, separation. We recently had this question in our college exam, and it was amazing how few of the registrars pinpointed uh, epiphyseal separations as being a high risk for um, non-accidental injury. And then the normal fall on outstretched hand we all know about. <clears throat> so I think if it's ever important to have extremely good quality x-rays, and I'll show you now, later why it's in uh, this age group of children. The perfect a AP is the, with the arm extended and your ray 90 degrees on the joint. Um, but in young children, it's preferable that you take the whole arm in this position so that you can go and look at relationships rather than actual the, just the elbow. If a child cannot extend, it's too painful for whatever reason, try and get a, your beam on the distal humerus rather on the normal beam we get from, from the radiologist that centers on oblique views within the elbow. The lateral, um, this is uh, the preferred position. It's comfortable for the kids. They're in a back slab already in most of the time. Sometimes you have to lift the arm up slightly to get a good view of the elbow. And what we basically want to see is the capitalum or the space, if you can't see the capitalum, should not overflow with the olecranon fossa. And why is this important? It's that more than 50% of all transphysical injuries uh, in a huge review is missed by radiologists. But we're also not uh, completely bone free 25% were missed by us. And the reason why we made the diagnosis of alba dislocation, supracondylar fractures, or that the child is normal. But they went, then went to look back. And most of the reason, most of those cases that was missed was due to poor quality oblique x-rays 
which looked like something like a lateral condyle fracture, and it actually, in fact, was a, um, uh, a transphysial fracture. So what do we look for? We look for very important alignment that's gone. This is probably the crux. The forearm is all basically always posteromedially displaced. If a capital thallum is there, it's great. It gives you an um, indication that the um, forearm is moved with the capital Soft tissue swelling, obviously, and nearly always a posterior fat pad sign and nearly never an anterior fat pad sign. So this is just a nice example. If your capitalum can be seen, you can see the whole complex used, uh, moved medially and posteriorly with a capitalum and the radius relationship still intact, with a radio um, uh, ulna joint still intact. So if a capitalum is already ossified, it's really useful, and you, you basically got your diagnosis, and you don't have to, to worry too much after that. The next thing you can look at is, is at the relationships between these bones. You've got your supracondylar fracture, you've got your two type of lateral condyle fractures, and then your transphysial fracture. So in broad terms, your alignment is a straight line for our purposes. And then, as I said before, 90, more than 90% time of your transphysial separations, you've got a posteromedial um, separation, and your radial ulnar joint uh, remains intact. With a um, supracondylar fracture, you usually got postromedial comminution and you usually fall in, uh, in, in varus with your um, radial ulnar joint intact. With your um, most type 2 lateral condyle fracture, it, especially if this is not ossified, it looks like a transphysial fracture, but you nearly always um, are displaced in the lateral position rather than the medial position of a um, transphysial fracture. And then lastly, uh, the one that can be really tricky and that gets sold off as normal a lot is your um, other lateral condyle fracture. But remember, you feel clinically there's an injury, you've, you've, you've made pretty sure it's not infection, and your alignment is in most of uh, the times it's, it's intact. So. If I, if I can sort of stress something here today, if you can get, uh, if you're unsure about the diagnosis, go get an ultrasound. It's really quite easy. You can actually do it yourself. And all you basically want from this ultrasound is to tell you that the cartilage are completely or partially um, off ended of the distal end of the humerus, and then you pretty much got your, your diagnosis. So this is just a nice example. There's the humerus. There's a capitalum uh, it's, uh, an with an anterior angle, which is normal, with your uh, radius. And here you can see the humerus with a completely disrupted capitalum and your radius. And it's really quite easy to do and, and to make your diagnosis. Don't want to say a lot about the MRI, but I personally, and a lot of the literature doesn't think there's a place for MRI in these children because it's expensive. It's actually quite difficult to read. and um, Certainly in my institution, they have to get an anesthetic to get an um, uh, uh, MRI, and then you have to take the kid to theater in any case. So it's in broadly not recommended as the uh, uh, auxiliary um, uh, imaging as of choice. And then lastly, arthrogram, it's, it's invasive, but most of the time you're taking the child to the theater, you're doing an arthrogram, that aids you, and you also use the arthrogram to aid you for your reduction. The only sort of uh, catch-22 comes in when you um, have to uh, take the child to theater, you do your arthrogram, you see it's either undisplaced or uh, there's no injury, and then you've taken the child to theater. But it's really useful in sort of your treatment flow diagram. So this is just an example of you can already see the ossification center. It's medially displaced. This, this diagnosis is easy. It's a physical separation. A close reduction was done, an arthrogram was done, and you can see it's still displaced and angulated, and it was redone, and then you can quite clearly see the nice realignment with regards to the, the um, physis. Um, very few classification systems in pediatric orthopedics I find useful at all, and it's the same in this classifications, but probably the only important thing is to re realize there's Salter Harris 1 and 2 physical separations. And this is constantly misdiagnosed as lateral condyle fractures rather than transphysial um, separations. So how do we treat this? It's in broad terms quite easy. The non-surgical 
many ma management is for the non-displaced or the minimal displaced uh, fractures, and then any injury presenting later than five days. The feeling is, uh, some, some literature refers to three days, that to me is a bit harsh, is that if you do not, if you uh, treat it after that, you're going to start causing physical damage, and it's important to remember that the physical damage in a transphysial fracture, if treated early, is minimal, uh, because it's such a smooth undulating surface which um, separates easy and falls back with minimal damage. So if you're already starting to get callus and so on and you force it back, you actually do start causing quite significant damage. So most of these cases, um, if it is displaced, we um, uh, would take them to theatre and the feeling is these days is stabilising after reduction. There's a high incidence of reoccursion of displacement if you try to do it with just a closed reduction. So when you're there, you, you should rather put in K-wires. And mostly you can do it with an arthrogram, closed reduction, percutaneous pinning, and then just reassessing with your arthrogram if you've got a good um, position. So the way we approach it in, in, in our unit is if we're unsure about the diagnosis, we do an ultrasound. If it's undisplayed or a late presentation, backslab for two to three weeks, observe for two to four years, um, just to make sure you don't get um, especially cubitus virus, and then if needed, we'll do a valgus osteotomy. This group very seldom end up in a group that needs a, that gets cubitus virus and needs a valgus osteotomy. Whereas, the displaced in the early presentation, uh, we'll do an arthrogram at all times, close reduction and pinning. It's actually quite an uh, easy reduction. Unlike supracondylar fractures, you've actually got two broad areas that wants to fit into each other. So a lot of time I just take it with my finger, I take the, um, and I just literally place it back um, on, onto the condyle, and uh, the maneuver is basically the same for, as for a supracondylar um, fracture. Again, plast of Paris, maximum two to three weeks, and this group you need to observe for quite a while to see if there's going to be any residual cubitus virus. Okay, so this is just a case study of one case. Again, as you can see, the posterior medial uh, or the medial um, translation. You can't see the capitalum. A reduction was done, but you can st still see it's displaced. And uh, on the lateral, you can see the capitalum is, is directed posterior. It should be angulated to the anterior aspect. Um, Arthrogram was done. Reduction was done. You can see the KYs looks quite large, you would think you use smaller KYs, but that's the suggestion that you actually really fill up that cavity, and as you can see uh, quite clear that the cap capitalum is now back in position. Two to three weeks later, you've got abundant callus formation, you've got your position, you start mobilizing this child. This is another case of, and I, can you see the sort of oblique in between x-rays what was taken? Um, this little fraction was, uh, was seen, it was diagnosed as a lateral condyle fracture. It was treated as a con lateral condyle fracture and with uh, maturity, oh, sorry, the child ended up in cubitus varus and had to have an osteotomy, a, 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 a valgus osteotomy. So the outcomes, if you've got prompt recognition and management, you've really got excellent outcomes with these cases, very few cases of os cubitus varus. If it's misdiagnosed, you do not get a reasonable uh, reduction um, or there's growth disturbances or osteonecrosis of a medial condyle, then there's actually a very high incidence of cubitus varus. Uh, also quite important to note that neurovascular complications and functional impairment is extremely rare. So you will be addressing your cubitus varus in the future um, rather for cosmesis, which can in this case be quite a significant thing than uh, treating for your functional impairment. So when you do have to do a correction of your cubitus varus, these various methods described, the two most popular ones is the French or the lateral closing wedge, where you actually maintain your, your medial cortex and you hinge on that, or the dome osteotomy although the dome has definitely got much more complications than the French. My problem with the French osteotomy is that you're adhering to rule free of osteotomies, and what I mean with that, your cora, or where your deformity is situated there, you're closing here, so you get this scenario. So you've corrected the cubitus varus, 
but now you've got a very prominent lateral condyle, so it goes from a one cosmetic problem to the next one. And the way to just um, treat, or, or, or treat that is to take this fragment and slide it medially again and use different fixation methods, and then you haven't got this um, uh, uh, prominent uh, 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 condyle. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, um, postnatal skeletal development can really guide us with regards to what's going on in the, in the uh, elbow when a child has an injury in that area. It's more about diagnosis than treatment. If you diagnose it early and treat it correctly, then uh, it's quite easy to treat and uh, use those KYs. Thank you very much. So our next, uh, we'll be taking questions at the end.